The Lord of the Rings is one of the most expansive and detailed fantasy worlds ever created, which makes sense because it's really kind of the first one. It spans tens of thousands of years and literally hundreds of characters. So when Screen Rant asked me if I wanted to break down a complete timeline in 15 minutes, my reaction was just a little bit aggressive. I'm here to break down The Lord of the Rings into a concise but informative video. However, before I start, I need to address a few things. Thank you. This is a relatively short YouTube video, so there's no way that I could cover everything. I mean, just trying to explain the Silmarillion would probably take me about an hour minimum. As such, I'm going to keep this fairly centered on the Lord of the Rings films and how they'll fit with the upcoming Rings of Power. And yes, I am going to go off of the films, which are relatively accurate to the books, but there are some slight differences. But you know what? This is what audiences know, so it's what I'm going with. So here we go. Eru, give me strength. Like every good and bad fantasy movie, our tale begins with a breathy narration and a flashback. Bonus points to Fellowship for not starting with a scroll that begins with Since the Dawn of Time. Eternals, I'm looking at you. During the Second Age, Sauron began his plan to conquer Middle-earth. The Fallen Arnor had crafted a series of dope rings to hand out to only the biggest chumps. I mean, coolest people who would look totally sweet with a new ring. However, he then crafted his own ring to control and bind all of those who accepted his unsolicited gift. Also, according to the game Shadows of Mordor, the rings were crafted by a moody blacksmith named Celebrimbor. That name's so fun to say that I sometimes just walk around my apartment exclaiming Celebrimbor. Celebrimbor is appearing in the upcoming Rings of Power, so it looks like I'm going to have even more opportunity to say Celebrimbor in the future. Celebrimbor. Anyways, the kingdoms of elves and men decided that they were having none of it and teamed up to overthrow the Dark Lord. The war took its final battle all of the way to the steps of Mount Doom. Things were going okay for the Alliance until Sauron himself showed up with the biggest mace that you've ever seen. Zug Zug for the Horde! Sorry, wrong franchise. Sauron then laid waste to his enemies until his fingers got chopped off by his seal door. Why the Dark Lord didn't just keep his left hand in his pocket for the whole battle, I'll never really know. I guess he didn't want to look like a moody teen Dark Lord. Isildur and the Elf Lord Elrond took the ring to the fires of Mount Doom, but Isildur punked out and kept the ring for himself. Bad form, Elrond. Should have just grabbed him and thrown both the ring and him into the lava, like Vader did to the Emperor at the end of Return of the Jedi. Isildur didn't wind up getting much use of the ring, though, because he was soon ambushed by a group of orcs. The ring fell from his body and into a nearby river. Galadriel's narration here explained that the ring betrayed him, but girl, he just lost it. When I drop my bowl of soup on the way to my computer, I don't then curse Campbell's sudden but inevitable betrayal. The ring stayed on the riverbed for millennia until it was found by a pair of river hobbits. They're like regular hobbits, but are wetter and smell slightly of carp. The river hobbits were Smeagol and his cousin. Actually, this pair of hobbits highlights something that I find endlessly hysterical about the works of Tolkien. This is a man who crafted an entire universe filled with thousands of years of lore and incredible detail. And that is something that deserves the utmost amount of respect. However, when it came time to figure out what Smeagol's cousin's name was, he wrote down Deagle and then presumably took a 15 minute break. Deagle and Smeagol argued over ownership of the newly found treasure until Smeagol drowned his cousin in a fit of ring-induced insanity. He then took his new prize and retreated into the mountains, where he spent about 450 years neglecting his hair, dental care, and getting just absolutely not enough vitamin D. Hobbits don't usually live that long, but the ring instills long life into those who have it. Well, alright, a long life provided you don't get stabbed by a bunch of orcs and then drown in a river because of the weight of your armor drags you down. Now going by Gollum, he hoarded his prize until he lost it to yet another hobbit by the name of Bilbo Baggins. Baggins was on his own adventure that I sadly do not have time to cover here, which is a bummer because that's actually my favorite book of all time. But he eventually returned home with the ring in his pocket, just in time to find everyone stealing his stuff. Okay, given that I just spent about 500 words on the prologue alone, let's try to pick up the pace here. I know I'm going to miss and skip over a lot of details, but there are whole channels dedicated to Lord of the Rings lore if you need more. I'm mostly just here to make jokes about Treebeard. Talk about getting wood, am I right? Anyways, Bilbo lives the next few decades in the Shire until his 111th birthday. He then threw a killer shindig that included fireworks provided by everyone's favorite wizard with a white beard that's not Dumbledore. Gandalf, however, saw that his longtime friend had a ring in his possession that made him just a little bit suspicious. The ring then ended up in Frodo's possession when Bilbo left for Rivendell and Gandalf himself left to hit the books. In the film, it's presented to us as a rather short time between when Gandalf figures out the nature of the ring and returns to the Shire. 
However, it's actually a decade or two according to the books. By the way, Gandalf was in a really terrible mood when he returned and told Frodo that he has to take the ring to the elven city of Rivendell. So now Frodo's off on his own adventure. I sure hope he doesn't get stabbed along the way. Frodo left the Shire with the Nazgul hot on his trail. These are a creepy bunch of former kings who seemingly got really into Pantera. Frodo managed to team up with his hobbit buddies Samwise, Merry, and Pippin along the way. After a few close calls, they made it to the seedy inn, the Prancing Pony. They then pick up Strider, a ranger who is actually the lost heir of Gondor, named Aragorn, the last chieftain of the Dúnedain of the North. But, you know, that's a whole other thing. You see, the hobbits were supposed to meet Gandalf at the inn, but unfortunately he got kinda held up. Gandalf went to see Saruman, one of the Ishtar and a powerful wizard. By the way, I do not have enough time to explain what an Ishtar is, but they're basically wizard angels, which is fun. Their ranks include the likes of Saruman, Gandalf, and Radagast. I wonder which one will turn out to be evil. Saruman betrayed Gandalf and stuck his ass up on the roof. Fortunately, a moth and a giant eagle came along and rescued him, so it all worked out. Back on the trail to Rivendell, the hobbits and the mysterious ranger were attacked by the Nazgul, and Frodo ended up stabbed. Oh no! They then ran into the elf maiden Arwen, who summoned some water horses to flush the Nazgul away. They then all ended up at Rivendell just in time for a mandatory team meeting. Eventually it was decided that a fellowship of heroes will then take the ring to Mount Doom. The fellowship includes Gimli the Dwarf, Legolas, and Sean Bean's Boromir, who I'm sure will make it out of this movie just fine. They then set out together, taking a trail that led them over a treacherous mountain. Eventually though, it became impassable due to some weather wizarding from Saruman. Also, Boromir here started acting really shady. The group was then forced to take a trail that led them through the underground dwarven kingdom of Moria. Things turned out worse when they found everyone dead in the place infested with goblins and cave trolls. Oh, and there was also a giant fire demon called the Balrog. The group escaped with their lives, but Gandalf was lost along the way. Don't worry though, he comes back in the sequel with a freshly bleached dye job. They then ran into a group of Wood Elves led by the film's narrator Galadriel. She gave Frodo a spoiler alert about what would happen if he failed, and actually it's the Raising of the Shire, which did happen in the books, but come on, do you want that last movie to be like five hours? Actually, you know what, don't answer that, I already know what you're gonna say. She then gave them all cool gifts and sent them on their way. Boromir wound up going all ring crazy and tried to snatch the ring from Frodo, but it was alright because he started a redemption arc that immediately ended with him getting arrowed to death. They then all split up with Sam and Frodo going to Mordor by themselves, and three buff boys going after a pair of kidnapped hobbits. And that's it for the first movie. How much time do I have left in this video? Oh, Time to pick up the pace, which is what Aragorn, Gimli, and Pretty Boy Legolas do. They tracked the hobbits to an orc camp, but were too late as the Riders of Rohan, led by Judge Dredd, had already wiped out the encampment. Also, obligatory mention of Viggo Mortensen actually breaking his toe here, yada yada yada. Merry and Pippin escaped into the forest and ran into a large talking tree with a big beard. In pure Tolkien fashion, his name is Treebeard. Merry and Pippin then spent most of the rest of the movie riding on Treebeard's back and complaining about arbor-based bureaucracy. To the filmmaker's credit though, they took the most boring chapter in the entire series and managed to make it less boring by splitting it up across the entire movie. So you know, much appreciated there guys. Aragorn and his little lads ran into Billy Butcher who had been kicked out of his kingdom by a king being puppeted by an extra greasy Brad Dorif. The voice of Chucky thought that he had everything under control until Gandalf the White blasted in with the KO. Meanwhile, Frodo and Sam captured Gollum, who was creeping on the pair while they slept. They then forced him to be their guide into Mordor, a plan that will have absolutely zero unintended consequences. Also, Gollum seemingly has some untreated DID. Frodo fell into a swamp, and eventually the trio were captured by Boromir's younger brother. Hey Tolkien, what's the name of Boromir's much fairer younger sibling? Oh, it's Faramir? Yeah, that makes sense. Eventually he lets them go because he's a lot cooler than his brother ever was. Back in Rohan, Aragorn and the gang decide to move the citizens to a much safer and more fortified Helm's Deep, because nothing screams safety quite like being trapped in a box canyon. They then proceeded to have the best battle in the entire franchise, even though it did involve Legolas snowboarding on a shield, which is just ridiculous. They ultimately won though with some help from Gandalf and Doomguy's Rough Riders. Also Merry and Pippin convinced the Ents to wreck up Saruman's place which is pretty satisfying to watch. The film closes on Sam, Frodo, and Gollum finally making it to the border of Mordor. Mordor's border. Celebrimbor. Just had to throw that in there just because. And here we are at the final stretch. 
I guess it's time for a certain king to return. However, he's going to have a hard time of it because the steward of Gondor is a real jerk about abdicating power. Merry, Pippin, Legolas, Aragorn, Gandalf, and Gimli were all reunited just in time to split up again. Gandalf took one hobbit and the rest get the other. That pair then rode to Gondor, tricked them into calling for aid, and started preparations for another massive battle. Aragorn wound up getting a new sword recycled from Narsil, Isildur's old sword, and a bunch of new ghost friends. Maybe friend is too strong of a word? Ghost co-workers? That seems more fitting. The Battle of Minas Tirith commences after a few smaller encounters, and naturally the Stuart takes the first opportunity to burn himself alive. If we were doing a list about top 10 cinematic death scenes, that one would definitely be on there. Frodo and his merry man also run into trouble with a giant spider, and then some hungry orcs. Gollum wound up betraying them like the little punk that he is, and Sam earned the franchise's MVP award for rescuing Frodo and then literally carrying him up a mountain. They arrive just in time to plunge the ring into lava, but oh no, Frodo has gone to the dark side in a completely unexpected heel turn. Afrakas with Gollum wound up sending both him and Frodo tumbling over the edge. However, Sam saved Frodo, while Gollum in the ring became really, really gross soup. During all of this, Aragorn and what was left of the armies of the two human kingdoms were providing a distraction at the gates. There, he delivered one of the franchise's best speeches, which is a feat because this series is absolutely loaded with good speeches. In fact, this one might be one of the best in cinematic history, period. It's just so good. Thankfully, Middle-earth realized that this movie was getting a little long in the tooth, and before Aragorn can get into all the bad guys, they wind up falling into a large hole. Also, Sauron's eye exploded, and Frodo and Sam were scooped up by a group of eagles. They're then flown back to Rivendell, where Frodo recovers. Everyone came in one at a time and dogpiled on top of him for some celebratory bed jumping and hair tussling. Everything worked out just fine for pretty much everyone, except for Boromir and most of his family. But at least Faramir got to hook up with a pretty badass shield maiden, so you know there's that. After a recovery period of a few months, they all head to Gondor for Aragorn's coronation. The hobbits then returned home to the Shire, where they lived happily for a few years, until Frodo and Bilbo boarded the boat for the Grey Havens. After a tearful goodbye, Sam returned home to his loving wife, the end. Finally, after like six false endings, that movie just wouldn't end. Not that I'm complaining, I could have watched The Lord of the Rings forever, but still, there's a lot of false endings there. All these years later, it still kind of bugs me. So how does this fit with the upcoming Rings of Power? Well, that series is taking place in the Second Age, all the way back in the prologue of the first movie. It will be about Sauron coming to power through the creation of the Rings. As I said earlier, Celebrimbor will be featured in the series. He crafted the Rings, but was portrayed by Sauron after he discovered their true purpose. No idea yet if his extra ring that was established in the Shadow of Mordor games will appear in the show, but it's possible. You can also expect to see some of the more divine and powerful beings sent to Middle-earth by Eru, the creator and supreme deity. While Gandalf and the other wizards featured in the movies fit this bill as well, they were not on Middle-earth during the Second Age. At least Gandalf wasn't. He was sent to Middle-earth in the Third Age, so don't expect him to be around in the series. Besides, Ian McKellen is looking far more like Gandalf the Grey than Gandalf the White these days. The biggest thing to look out for, though, are the initial Maiar or Primordial Spirits, who were in far greater numbers at the time. Gee, I wonder what is going to happen over the course of that series. I wonder how it's going to end. Like I said at the start of this video, the world of Middle-earth is so expansive and detailed that this video barely scratches the surface. The Rings of Power will give us a lot more context and history when it comes to the Lord of the Rings, but we'll also have to do a lot of interpretation. There's a lot of history and myth in the world of Middle-earth, and this September, we'll get even more. Maybe we'll even finally get to see Tom Bombadil and his super hot wife, Middle-earth's ultimate power couple. All in all, I'm personally quite excited to see what the Rings of Power will bring to the table. I read The Silmarillion years ago, so my knowledge of what actually went down in the days before The Lord of the Rings is a little fuzzy. While I expect we'll see some deviation from Tolkien's work, the folks at Amazon have already tell us to expect that to be the case in some minor regards, I also figure it'll fit in nicely with the rest of the stories we've gotten from Middle-earth. And heck, if it does well, maybe we'll see a future adaptation of something like Unfinished Tales, or Baron and Luthien, the children of Hurin. Heck, maybe we'll even see the fall of Gondolin. 
a book that actually wasn't released that long ago. There are so many more stories set within the world of Middle Earth that could serve as a basis for more film and television adaptations, all of which would be fantastic to finally see adapted so that fans everywhere can enjoy them just as much as they did those classic Lord of the Rings films. Would you guys like to see more videos like this? Ones where we kind of do a TLDR breakdown of something before another major release that is related to it? Thanks for watching and be sure to subscribe to Screen Rant for even more great videos just like this in the future.